Now, this historian talks about the medical practices of slaves and how influential they were back in the day. And it, it just goes to show you that there's a lot of lies about slaves, about black people, about Africans, and how inferior they are. And it couldn't be further from the truth. So I want you to listen to this and <laughs> really, really absorb it because it's really fascinating. The early American colonies are getting hit with a lot of diseases. You know, ships are coming, arriving, bringing what we now know are new microbes to the people of Boston. They had no idea at the time. They suspected it might be some bad air or bad food or, or evil spirits, all of these things. Smallpox hits quite often. And Cotton Mather is very interested in reading the medical journals, particularly that of the Royal Society of London, and also in contributing to them. Because he wants to show that Boston is a significant part of the British Empire and can contribute to the knowledge of people within the empire. It's about 1706 when his church decides that in order to reward him, that they'll provide him with a slave. Mather names him Onesimus. Now, yes, there are slaves, there are also free blacks in the Massachusetts colony this time. Slavery is legal in the Massachusetts all the way up to the time of the American Revolution. I mean, it might work a little different in Massachusetts than it may in the South, uh, but the terms of the deal are the same. Onesimus was not free to go. But Mather does a few things that might separate him from others. He teaches Onesimus how to read and write, and he converts him to Christianity. I mean, that's part of the reason of teaching him how to read and write so that he can read the Bible. And the most important reason we know about Onesimus is from Mather's own diary. And in 1716 or so, he has a conversation with him about the smallpox. And Onesimus tells him that in Africa, it's very common to take a thorn and then take some of the pus from an infected person and injure yourself and put the pus into your own wound. And when you do that, you'll be inoculated from the smallpox. You won't get it again. There's a question as to whether this is the first that Mather's heard of it or if it's just confirming things that he's heard in other places in medical journals and the like. But he confirms it by talking to other Africans, free and slave, who are in Boston and find that many of them have a scar because of this practice. By the time Boston gets hit with another smallpox epidemic, early 1720s, Mather has already released Onesimus. See, we don't know a lot about Onesimus, but apparently by earning money somehow, perhaps doing other work for other people, he bought his own freedom. But when the smallpox epidemic once again hits Boston, Mather remembers his conversation with Onesimus, and he has his own son inoculated. He also brings a Dr. Boylston into the process. He's a supporter. He has his own son inoculated as well. But they want to do more than that. See, Mather is an influencer. If he's behind inoculation, he's going to get others. So he writes a journal article and an advertisement in the New England Current. This is the paper of James Franklin, brother of Ben. Ben's working for the paper at this time. Talking about the miracle of inoculation and how it's worked for them. He also goes before the town supervisors and wishes to have the process of inoculation set as the policy of the colony. Well, this starts a month-long debate, including a series of nasty letters in the New England Current. August 14th, 1721, New England Current. This advertisement ought to supersede the fable of the fox, who by misadventure, losing his tail, advises his fellow citizens to part with their tails. And there's even some satire from the Franklin brothers and attacks from them while they're running the paper on the position of Dr. Boylston and Cotton Mather. The debate is so intense going back and forth Doctors are attacking the reverend for using quack medicine. At one point, a bomb is thrown into Mather's house. So this is a pretty intense debate of the vaxxers and anti-vaxxers of their day. And I mean, you can kind of see it because the last thing you would think is of giving a healthy person a disease in order 
to uh, prevent them from it. You know, now we know the scientific basis for it, but they had no idea at that time. It just seemed like some kind of magic. And so it fell to someone who was a religious authority, although had an interest in science, who had faith enough to use it rather than a person who was a scientist and could prove it, which it couldn't be proved, and it wouldn't be proved for another two centuries almost. So the Africans knew about this for the longest time. The slaves, black people, we knew about this for the longest time. And white people were just so skeptical about it. And the thing is that, well, if they had this amazing civilization back in the day, Greece and Rome, and throughout the centuries, they didn't know about this stuff. It should be well known amongst their people. There should be no debate about it. 200 years from that time, so like in, a, in the 20th century, that's when they really confirmed that, oh yeah, inoculation, it's pretty good. Like, well, the Africans knew about this for the longest time. So the Aaron, right then and there, you know that there's something wrong with the history of white people. Like they're lying about the history. How could you have these great civilizations and all this knowledge, but yet you don't know anything about inoculation? And you find it skeptical and they're debating about it. Well, the Africans, they just, there's no debate. It's just, that's, that's how it is. You understand? So <laughs> it just goes to show you how much lies there are in history. Now I'm going to play more. That's very interesting. And they say a lot of, uh, this uh, historian says a lot of other interesting things as well. I bring this up because a few weeks ago we talked about vaccines and I was asked about what about Mather's contribution and what about the contribution of a slave to medicine? It wasn't a complete history of vaccines, but I think that this story is interesting in the context of that because you have both a debate between vaxxers and anti-vaxxers in history and the idea that an African-American contributed to modern medicine. But the influence of people who were held in slavery on modern medicine is not limited to just Onesimuth. James Potter Collins is a white Revolutionary War veteran in South Carolina. He becomes ill in October 1802, and no one's quite sure what his illness is. He consults with a series of regular physicians. They're all unsuccessful. Finally, the last physician who sees them says, he's a younger person. He says, look, have you ever tried African poison or tricking, as he called it? Collins replies, yeah, I have heard of it, but I'm not a believer. The doctor explains, like, look, you know, we medical men reject the doctrine as an absurdity, and it's against our interest to admit it, but a man may be convinced against his own judgment. We have had three cases, exactly the same as yours, failed in them all, and two of the men got perfectly cured very simply by applying to an old African and are now both well and hardy men. So Collins decides to take the doctor's advice, describes this whole thing in his autobiography, and he doesn't even know how to describe it because he's doing something that's so weird for his time, but it's just because of his illness. He says, I, I began to consult with this oracle, ephod, or whatever name you might choose to give it, for I have none. I felt a little sullen thinking it would turn out to be mere balderdash. He to I told him of the, the complaint, and he told me if I would stay some 10 or 12 days, he would cure me. Colin's still skeptical. I complied literally with the instructions of this magician, or whatever it might be termed, and however strange it may appear to others, I was entirely cured. Slaves brought with them medical practices from Africa, and they were healing people in the Americas. You had slaves who were experts in herbal medicine. And that knowledge did enter the entire society. So using gems and weed for rheumatism, chestnut leaf for asthma, boiling a teacup of logwood chips, using sassafras root kind of as a general blood cleaner, snake root, mayapple, red pepper, pine needles, red oak bark, wintergreen tea, garlic, catnip. Slave healers would make plasters of mustard. So you take some mustard powder, a little water, spread it on a cloth and put it on the person's chest. Not too long. It's going to be just a few minutes or else it's going to burn. And that's going to help draw blood to the surface and decrease congestion when they have it. Their cure for pneumonia. Physician resources in America are limited. So 
slave owners would have certain slaves designated to treat the other slaves when they got sick and they had a certain level of control over their care that varied from place to place and the temperament of the owner of course there were some that didn't believe in any of this others did and we know a lot of this from the WPA interviews in the 30s that were conducted of people who were very old but had been slaves Joe Hawkins, a former slave, had told his WPA interviewer that doctors didn't treat a person like they do now. They bleed you so many minutes while they watched a big watch that they always carried. They bled you for almost any sickness, even against smallpox. Another former slave, uh, Sylvia King, remembered. There weren't many doctors in them times, but there was a closet full of simples, home remedies. And almost all the women, white or black, could go to the woods to get their medicine. Wes Brady, another slave in Texas, told his WPA interviewer that the white doctor who was hired to care for the slaves on the plantation where he lived would help the slaves because he didn't want to introduce the traditional medicine treatments. That doctor informed the master that a slave was pretty sick. Sometimes they stay in bed three or four days taking flower pills, he said. This was to allow the herbal medicines, which he felt were better anyway, to heal. There are articles that appear in the medical journals throughout the 1800s, not many of them, but a few, where the evidence that Virginia doctors are citing are in the, the use of the medicine among their slaves. You have a Dr. R.S. Bailey in 1856 addresses the South Carolina Medical Association you have, uh, where he's addressing particular remedies as being from an African-American origin. 1850, South Carolina physician Dr. Edward Mitchell writes an article for the Charleston Medical Journal and Review talking about Black Root Mitchell and its role in curing disease. Also, valuable medicinal plants known as yet only to some of our black population. Now, we also know that in 1825, a slave, Jane Minor of Petersburg, was emancipated for her healing ability. She has her own freedom granted, and she earns enough money to free 16 other slaves. 1749, in South Carolina, the legislature frees a slave named Caesar and pays him 100 pounds per year for his life for revealing his cure for poisons and rattlesnake bites. Here's another one, 1729, a slave named Papin is referred to in the Virginia Council Journal as a doctor who was freed for revealing his cures, ordered to remain under the direction of the government until he make a discovery of some other secrets he has for expelling poison and the cure of other diseases. Now, isn't that fascinating? Black people are, are inferior, slaves are inferior, um, black people didn't even have any history to speak of, blah, blah, blah. You know, white people did this, white people did that. You know, if they were so knowledgeable, you know, with all these great civilizations, they should know way more than us. But yet, we were the ones that were teaching them about medicine. And I don't remember, I have to find out where I heard this, and then I'll, I'll make another video about that, but I heard that the Moors who invaded Spain, who were black, invaded Spain, and when all was said and done, they did a recording of the medical practices of white people back in the day, and it was atrocious, and this is over a thousand years ago. Their medical practices were atrocious back then. So the invasion was like, if Spain was like in 711, let's say like two centuries later, uh, they, they recorded the medical practices, and it was atrocious. It was atrocious, I can't remember who, who said this, I, I, I have to get back to you on that, but oh my goodness, it was atrocious, they said. It was really ridiculous, their medical practices, and it makes sense. And then you, you go thousand years in the future, in the, in, the, in the 18th century, even before that, obviously they didn't know stuff, you know, but we're, we're talking about the 18th century, and they didn't know about inoculation. Like, they were completely clueless about inoculation. Like, it should be well-known. It was well-known amongst Africans, but it wasn't well-known amongst uh, white people. So it's like, okay, well, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong with their story about their own history. It's just ridiculous. This account comes from an Islamic physician who encountered a Christian doctor at work. They brought me a knight who had an abscess on his leg and a woman suffering from consumption. 
I made a plaster for the night and the swelling opened and improved. For the woman, I prescribed a diet to revive her consumption. But then the Frankish doctor arrived and objected. Bring me a strong knight with a well-sharpened battle axe, he said. The knight struck a blow, the marrow of the leg spurted out, and the wounded man died on the spot. As for the woman, their doctor affirmed the devil must have entered her head. Then he grasped a razor and cut an incision in the shape of a cross, exposing the bone of the skull and rubbing salt into the wound. The woman died in the instant. I returned home, having learned much about the medicine of the Christians.